I was at General Assembly last week when they passed a statement of conscience about the corruption of our democracy. Now this schedule was several, scheduled, this sermon had been scheduled several months ago, but I didn't realize quite how timely it was going to be. It was just two weeks before the 4th of July when our delegates approved this ringing reaffirmation of our fifth principle, the use of democratic process in our congregations and in society at large. Independence Day is the last and largest of three summer holidays that start with Father's Day and the summer solstice. And it's followed by two, two, two other significant July revolutions, the French and the Cuban. When I scheduled the service, I had to figure out how these were all connected. What do fathers have to do with revolutions? Quite a bit, it turns out. <laughs> now, some fathers invest all their efforts into conception, whether it is a child, a revolt against authority, a new scientific idea, or a new form of art. But fathering is not just the biological act of creation. Fathering can and should be the longer, more demanding process of raising the infant to maturity of nurturing and mentoring. Whether it is a child, a new nation, a scientific idea. The sun god, who is at the peak of his powers at the summer solstice, was born at the winter solstice. He got the maiden, the maiden pregnant with his successor and that pretty much exhausted his parental duties. In my own extended family, I have seen that minimalist kind of fathering firsthand. My father left home when I was two and I only saw him twice after that. On the other hand, I have observed my late husband taking fathering very seriously. He nurtured and mentored not only his three biological daughters, but also his three sons-in-law, two of whom did not get the parenting they needed from their own fathers. Many of the customs of the summer solstice that is celebrated at noon, and then with bonfires, now with, now with fireworks, have relocated to Independence Day. So this feels like a suitable time to honor our founding fathers, who not only created a new nation, but did their best to parent it into maturity. For a nation, the act of conception is often a revolution. Revolution is an uprising against authority in order to replace that authority with something else, a different system, a different person, a different belief that will be better. Revolution against governmental authority is often a last resort when other peaceful means have failed. That's what Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence. First, people may try elections, demonstrations, protests, civil disobedience, and or nonviolent re resistance. And in the 21st century, tweets and other social media. They didn't have those in the 1700s. Evolution can be a, an alternative to revolution as it was for Canada. Or it may follow a successful revolution to help that, that nation or whatever grow and thrive. As Ecclesiastes might have said, if he thought of it, there is a time to revolt and a time to wait, a time to change and a time to remain the same. And if Hamlet got over himself and meditated on the bigger picture, he might have soliloquized thus. To revolt or not to revolt, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous oppression or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. Thank you, Hamlet. Appreciate that thought. A successful revolution creates institutions that allow for evolution and peaceful transition of power. And in that sense, the US Revolution was a success, but it was at a painful and divisive cost. Canada took a slower and less painful route. Which was the better choice? Was revolution the only answer? From the perspective of almost two and a half centuries, even those of us who have gotten to see Hamilton <laughs> might still blame both sides of the American Revolution for the high cost of slugging it out on the battlefield. And a lot of those battlefields are right here in South Carolina. In the midst of the Civil War, Lincoln seemed to think that both the Revolution and the Civil War served a painful but necessary purpose. At Gettysburg, he said, Feel free to recite along with me. <laughs> Four score and seven years ago, a new nation was born on this continent, conceived in liberty, and dedicated the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether this nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. 
the founding fathers, George Washington, John Hancock, Benjamin Franklin, lots of Adamses, James Madison, James Monroe, Patrick Henry, Charles Pinckney, he's from South Carolina, Alexander Hamilton, and many others. They started our revolution with the Declaration of Independence. Despite all odds, they won, largely due to Lafayette, who wasn't a founding father because he wasn't American. Well, at this point, not only the, the Sun, Sun King, but also lots of other victorious conquerors like Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar and Genghis Khan would probably look around and said, my work is done. Now, where's the booty? Where's, where's the benefits of conquest? But a popular revolution seeking democracy is different. Just ask the people in Venezuela. One of my favorite Buddhist books reminds us that after the, the Enlightenment, there is still the laundry. <laughs> After the revolution is won, there's the hard work of nurturing the resulting nation into a way of being together that will make it less likely that we'll have to revolt again. And our founding fathers were up to the task, beginning with their mission statement in the preamble that Janie read today. They took a careful look at what did not seem to work well from their English heritage and tried to create institutions that would make it harder to have concentrated and sustained power in the hands of a few. Yes, they made mistakes. Fathers confronted by a new being that they don't understand make mistakes too, including, you know, like pinning the diaper to the baby. <laughs> the first mistake after the American Revolution was the Articles of Confederation. The second time they got closer to right with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Our first six presidents and many senators and cabinet members came from that fathering group that guided our new nation through the first 50 years of its life, correcting mistakes, trusting the process, and trying to keep democracy alive. Revolutions aren't just against government authority. There are revolutionary developments in science and art and music and technology, even in gender roles which is why some of you may haven't heard me singing sisterhood instead of brotherhood in the, in the opening hymn. <laughs> Bad habit of mine. And there is resistance, always resistance. The essence of conservatism in its original meaning is resisting change, holding on to what is good, respecting tradition and the past. The essence of liberalism is to set free, to seek change, to be open to different truths and different ways of being. Both have a role to play in both governance and religion in shaping our culture and our common life. Religion is inherently resistant to change, except maybe ours, uh, but it's still subject to revolutions in our understanding of what constitutes the sacred, the answers to the great questions of truth and meaning, the role of religious community, what our faith offers us and what our faith asks of us. Historically, there have been many religious revolutions. We immediately think of Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, and Buddha, and Lao Tse, and Zoroaster, and Calvin, and Luther, and George Fox, and our own Michael Savitas and Francis David. Blood was shed in birthing each of them. Our faith tradition descends from three of those religious revolutions, Moses and Judaism, Jesus and Christianity, and the radical wing of the 16th century Reformation. The historical strands that gave rise to Unitarian and Universalism were probably more evolutionary than revolutionary. Universalism is an ancient Christian heresy, heresy dating back to Origen in the second century and Pelagius in the fourth. Over time, the idea of universal salvation came to be accepted as truth among the majority of Christians, but certainly in this country. Unitarianism also harks back to the early church and the controversy of who Jesus was, a question that came up again in the 16th century radical reformation. Now the primary reformation, the one you learned about in the history books, not the one our Unitarian ministers learned about in divinity school. Uh, the primary reformation was the reformation of Luther and Calvin and Henry VIII. And it was more about government and nationalism than religion. All three of them challenged the authority of the Roman church. Then they replaced it with a different hierarchy, closely linked to the government, with established and tax-supported churches. They made changes in the form of worship and sacraments and protested against corruption in the church, including sale of indulgences. But the negative theology of original sin and Jesus died for our sins and the top-down authority of the church, they didn't mess with that. The radical wing of the Reformation, that's our wing, 
They didn't want to replace the authority of the Catholic Church with the authority of state-sponsored religion. Our beginnings in Eastern Europe took a different path. The Edict of Torba in 1568, put, by, put forth by Unitarian King of Transylvania, only Unitarian King ever known to exist, <laughs> Recognized four established state-supported faith traditions, Catholic, Lutheran, Reformed, and Unitarian. But if you wanted to be something else, that was fine. They just wouldn't support it with taxes. Quakers minimized the need for churches and formal services, relying on the inner light, gathering in community, mainly for mutual support. Baptists, Unitarians, and Congregationalists all embraced congregational polity, which made each congregation its own authority in matters of faith and practice and governance. Unitarians, Mennonites, Anabaptists, and other dissidents challenged such long-held doctrines as original sin, predestination, and substitutionary atonement. And my editor says, take a breath here. <laughs> For both Unitarians and Universalists, the American Revolution is very much part of our story. This new nation replaced monarchy with democracy and government even as many, but not all, American faith traditions replace the authority of kings and bishops with democracy in our congregations. Let me repeat that. The American Revolution is our story, replacing monarchies, monarchy with democracy and government, even as we replace the authority of kings and bishops with democracy in our religious life. Some of our religious ancestors were key players in both revolutions, political and religious. John Adams, son John Quincy Adams, who was a founding member of a Unitarian church in Washington, DC. Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence, who believed that by the end of the 18th century, everybody would be Unitarian. Okay, forecasting was not his long suit. <laughs> Universalist Benjamin Rush, signer of the Declaration of Independence. Resistance to external authority is in the national D DNA, and it's also in our religious DNA. Historian Frederick Jackson Turner wrote in 1893 that American democracy was formed on the frontier. This constant movement resulted in egalitarianism, a lack of interest in high culture, and violence. Reminds me of my favorite quote from George Will, which is, in which he says, our national sport uh, combines the two worst traits of the American character, violence punctuated by committee meetings. <laughs> okay, put that back on. Uh, there was no landed gentry. There was no, uh, the American frontier established liberty by setting Americans free from such European habits as standing armies, established churches, aristocrats, and nobles. There was no landed gentry who controlled most of the land and charged heavy rents and fees. Frontier land was practically free for the taking, but with the closing of the frontier, it was harder for dissidents or dissenters to ignore a conflict and problems by just moving west. Well, Unitarianism and Universalism were both in their infancy at the time of the Western settlements, except for the West Coast, also known in some circles as the Left Coast. The UUs had only limited presence in the West in 1893. We were concentrated on the East Coast until World War II, or after World War II, when Unitarians established a Southern and Western kind of religious community, the Lay Led Fellowship, which includes this one. These small autonomous congregations had a tendency toward what became known as fellowship culture, somewhat anarchist, uncomfortable with compromise and commitment, resistant to rules and order, impatient with process when they wanted action. These attitudes helped to account for the high turnover in congregational membership because leaving is the easiest way to revolt. But as a scientifically minded religious culture, we believe in evolution. We also believe in the need for community and compromise because at its best, that's what democracy is all about. And many congregations, including ours, are lucky enough to have had founding fathers and mothers who not only participated in the creation, but dedicated many decades of their lives to nurturing and guiding these congregations into religious adulthood. Revolution is always tempting but it's a havoc wreaking weapon that should be used sparingly, if at all. Instead, we, as individuals, as communities, as nations, are called to be the adult in the room and do the serious work of parenting as our legacy for those yet to come. Remember, our hymnal says we're a living tradition. We evolve. 
and we have to do our best to manage our evolution in a democratic way. Most of all, we choose evolution over revolution because we know that what unites us is stronger than what divides us. We are united by our democratic polity and by our covenant. We are united by our commitment to go beyond voting on issues in the congregation to seeking consensus, knowing that we're seldom going to get unanimity. Consensus demands attentive lis listening and openness to compromise, and it's hard work. We are also united by our principles, including respect for one another, acceptance of differences, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, and the use of the democratic process. All these values and processes are the groundwork for evolutionary and peaceful change. To the extent that we honor our covenants and principles in the life of our political and religious communities, our founding mother, fathers and mothers in democracy and religion would be proud of us. You come back to this place week after week, drawn by the experience of community, affirming the shared values that unite us, cherishing the diversity that both enriches and challenges us. You come back, even if you didn't get your own way in the last congregational meeting. You come back, even if you find the congregation too liberal politically or too conservative or even too political. You come back, even if you don't like the hymns because most of the available religious alternatives are not grounded in democracy and do not call themselves a living tradition. Far too many religious communities do not encourage their members to become adults, free to choose, but also responsible and accountable for the choices they make and the community that affirms that freedom. We are the frontier religion for better or for worse. As Stephen Decatur once said, my country right or wrong, if right to be kept right, if wrong to be set right. May our nation, our state, our faith tradition, and our faith communities be affirmed by our devotion and be allowed and encouraged to evolve in that spirit. And I do want to end with a, a word from our sponsor. Um, Janie Shipley and I are both members of the Board of Directors of the League of Women Voters of South Carolina. I am the co-president. She is the National Issues Chair. We have both served as president of the Clemson League. And the purpose of the League is to encourage informed citizen participation in government. So one of the places Janie and I practice our religion is in the League. <laughs> Amen and blessed be.